Good morning. morning. Well, let's begin class with prayer. Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for your love. We thank you for your truth. We thank you for your watch care. Dear dear Heavenly Father, we ask that your spirit would be with us now to uh, guide us in our discussions, to transform our hearts, to renew us in your love, and to give us your wisdom. We pray in your holy name. Amen. Amen. All right, we, um, a couple of announcements. Next week, September 11, we will do two lessons. We will start lesson 13 of this quarter at 9.30 a.m. So put in your calendar to be here at 9.30. We're going to start at 9.30. Go to 10.30, and then we're going to take a five-minute break and do the first lesson in the new quarter, which is on present truth in Deuteronomy from 10.35 to 11.35. There'll be no Q&A next week because we're, we're doubling up. And then the following week, we won't meet because our entire leadership team is going to be at the American Association of Christian Counselors manning our exhibit booth, giving away our materials to Christian counselors. I guess there's probably about 6,000 of them coming to this event in Orlando. Uh, ben Carson will be there also and, and be speaking uh, there, uh, during the event. And so you pray for us uh, that we'll have a good, uh, a good uh, event and be able to share these resources. And there's uh, other announcements in the, uh, in the notes if you'd like to check those out. Uh, Remember, my, my notes each week are available um, after class. Usually the next day, Dean has them up at the website. Go to the website, Bible study, find the quarter uh, and the lesson you want. You scroll down, there's a PDF. You can download the PDF. And when I put links and stuff in my notes, they're available there for you to follow. We're doing lesson 12, Rest in Christ, and the title is The Restless Prophet. Uh, just before I get into this, I, I will announce many of you will be relieved to know we will not have an extensive COVID discussion today. <laughs> okay, that is not, we will actually spend the, uh, our time in the lesson, but, but before we do, I, I feel need because of the emails and co- communication I've been getting to clarify what our class has been and what I've been doing the last few weeks, because some have uh, emailed that, that, that I, I have not been presenting the Bible, I have not been presenting the gospel when I'm talking about COVID. And so uh, in one of my conversations with a physician, I'm going to read you a little section of my response to him to clarify what I've been attempting to do. And if, and if you haven't seen that, then, then, then I, I'll work to try to communicate it better. But I hope this will clarify. Because he was suggesting that I need to get to the, the end time message, the message for this time, which is the eternal gospel, the three angels message. That's what I need to present. So my response. And what is the message for this time? Is it not the message of God's character that results in the sealing of the saints into the character of God? And how does that happen? By first knowing God and second choosing to apply God's law, methods, principles to our lives and how we treat others. If we claim cognitive knowledge of God's character but still practice the methods of Satan, then we develop the character of Satan. So how do you think the final message of God's character that transforms people goes forward? It is by living out God's principles of truth, love, and liberty and how we treat others. The COVID issue with lies, coercion, accusations, silencing, fear peddling is one of Satan's end time attacks on God's people to get them to choose to save lives by the application of Satan's methods, thereby uh, allowing them to think they are doing godly work while they ruin their character and misrepresent God with the application of satanic methods. Read, reading Ellen White more widely, especially about the final events before Christ comes, and we discover that she describes events will unfold that will put people into positions that will require them to act out, live out their true principles that they cherish, thereby solidifying their characters either into Christ's likeness or the satanic. I believe the COVID mandates are part of this end-time issue by getting people to choose to coerce and compel other people's consciences rather than presenting truth and love and leaving them free. The COVID issue is a worldwide issue, and the church, with all its institutions, has the opportunity to present the true gospel by standing up for the principles of truth, love, and liberty, respecting conscience, opposing coercion of conscience on this issue. Could you imagine if the SDA worldwide church, schools, hospitals, clinics, missions, all actively opposed coercion on this issue, not opposed promoting the vaccine with evidence and liberty, but opposed the methods of imperialism? That attention of millions, perhaps billions, would be drawn to the church. People would inquire, who are these people? The opportunity to, um, would be to present God as creator, his design laws, the health message, and the principles of love, which always leave people free. And, 
and Jesus, in describing the end when, when separating the sheep from the goats, said differentiating factor would be how Jesus was treated in the person of other people. As you've done it unto the least of these, you've done it unto me. Thus, it isn't just theological constructs one holds about God. It is also living out the love of God and how we treat others, meaning truth presented in love, leaving people free. So the issue is setting up the world. As they practice coercing others for a good cause to save lives, then those methods become accepted into the heart, their characters change, and they will accept those same methods on the next issue. So that's, that's what I wrote. It's really not ultimately about the injection. It's about methods. And that's what I've been trying to say. So let's go on into our lesson now. Uh, jo uh, Sunday's lesson, Jonah ran from God. And for, excuse me, from God's call. God called him to go preach to Nineveh. Jonah, Jonah ran. Why? Well, okay, he hated it. So, yes. So let's read the fourth and fifth paragraph in Sunday's lesson. It says, Historical and archaeological records document the cruelty of the Neo-Assyrian overlords who dominated the ancient Near East during the 8th century BC, the time that Jonah ministered in Israel. About 75 years later, the Neo-Assyrian king Sen Sen Sennacherib uh, attacked Judah. Israel and Samaria already had fallen about 20 years earlier, and King Hezekiah uh, apparently had joined the local anti-Assyrian coalition. Now the time had come for Assyrians to settle accounts. The Bible, historical Assyrian, the Bible, historical Assyrian documents, and the wall relief of Sennacherib's palace in Nineveh all tell us the cruel story about the fall of Lachish, one of the most important and well-fortified southern borders fortresses of Hezekiah. In one inscription, Sennacherib's claim to have taken more than 200,000 prisoners from 46 fortified cities that he claimed to have destroyed. When the Assyrian king took Lachish, hundreds or thousands of prisoners were impaled, hardcore supporters of King Hezekiah were flayed alive, while the rest uh, were sent to Assyria as cheap slave labor. Why did Jonah hate the Nineveh? Or excuse me, not want to go. Let's, let's say that. Not want to go on God's call. The Assyrians were enemies of the people of Judah and Israel. The people were dispersed or, or uh, had some taken captive. What would have been the normal human response to what we just read? Yeah. Have you been watching the news the past two weeks about what's happened in Afghanistan? Bombings, shootings, report, and reports that the ISIS-K and the Taliban, which normally don't get along, have put aside their differences and joined together for a common purpose at this point in time. And that purpose is to kill all the infidels still in Afghanistan, which means all the Christians. <clears throat> As these reports come out, what is your attitude? Do we understand why Jonah may have had a negative attitude toward the Ninevites? What do we learn from Jonah's experience that is important for us today at this time in Earth's history? What did God want from Jonah? Did God want Jonah to hate the Ninevites or to love them? What did he want for Jonah? Did he want him to hate the Ninevites or to love them? <laughs> That's a little nauseating to think about, isn't it? People who flayed your loved ones, impaled your loved ones. But these people were cruel to Jonah's people. Surely God would want justice, wouldn't he? He would want them to be punished for their crimes, wouldn't he? Surely Jonah was right to, to, to run away from God until God became righteous enough to recognize reparations were in order. Shouldn't he? I mean, these, these are terrible wrongs. Slavery, impaling, flaying. Or was there something wrong with Jonah? That Jonah didn't want to take the message of repentance to Nineveh. The point where he would rather die than go. 
to the point he'd rather die. Something wrong with Jonah. Could it be that Jonah didn't, fu- didn't fully understand reality? That Jonah didn't comprehend the sin problem in its right setting? That Jonah was seeing things through the human, worldly law lens and not through God's perspective? What does sin do to sinners? What does sin do to sinners? What happens to the person who is cruel to another person? What happens to them? Imagine what would happen to you if you were flaying somebody alive. So if someone is cruel to you and or yours, you or, you or yours, your family, what happens inside of them? From God's perspective, if you are in a saving relationship with Jesus Christ and someone treats you badly, what does God want from you in that situation? Reaction of love. Does God want us to be useful in some way for his cause to somehow present a saving message to the very one who's mistreating us? Is that what we want if someone mistreats us? So if you're gay and you've had been denied services, you've been mocked, you've been belittled, or you've been beaten up, what is your natural desire toward those who have mistreated you? And what would God have your attitude and actions be towards those who've mistreated you? If you're black and you've been falsely arrested, accused, denied work, mistreated, discriminated against, what is your natural desire towards those who have mistreated you? And what would God have your attitude and actions be towards those who've mistreated you? If you're white in a society, in society and, and you experience what you believe is reverse discrimination, denial of promotion through what you consider woke policies, what is your attitude and natural desire towards those who've mistreated you? And what would God have your attitude be towards those who you determine have wronged you? If you are vaccinated in society, what is your attitude towards those who are unvaccinated? And what would God have your attitude be towards them? If you're unvaccinated and you've been pressured fired, denied travel, or wronged in some way, what is your attitude towards those who are oppressing you? And what would God have your attitude be toward them? Do we find lessons for life today in the story of Jonah? Yes. Did Jonah, as a Jew, have reasons to harbor negative feelings toward the Assyrians? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Could Jonah have developed his own biases and prejudices because of those experiences? Could it have conditioned him to not see them as individuals and evaluate them on the merits of their own persons? And could he have globalized them? They're Assyrians. They're not worthy. And so God even says in Jonah 4, there are 120,000 who can't tell the left from the right. Not to mention all the cattle. And you care more for this vine than you do for them. Do we see one of straight Satan's strategies here? How well, here's a strategy on how Satan advances his kingdom. I want you to see it because folks, almost everybody you know is being manipulated by this strategy right now in our society. One of Satan's strategies is by inspiring people who are vulnerable to his inspiration to do real injustice to somebody else, to, do, to wrong somebody. And then to have those who have been wronged respond with hostility, anger, and a desire for retaliation, or perhaps in modern society we would call that the pursuit of justice by getting hold of authority to make them pay for the injustice that they've done. And it's back and forth, back and forth, 
back and forth. What's the solution? If you've experienced real wrongs, is it best to seek retribution, inflicted punishment, to make the perpetrator pay? Is that the best? If we use those powers, and we have them, let's say we have them, we can do it. Will that result in the highest level of peace, love, joy, and friendship? What's needed to bring lasting peace? What are God's methods to deal when real wrongs happen? Have you heard the saying, an eye for an eye and the whole world goes blind? Can we advance God's cause by seeking retribution upon those who've done us wrong? Yes or no? And we're talking real wrong here. We're not talking with just us thinking it's wrong. It's real wrong. What about justice? Well, we won't seek retribution. We just seek justice. Justice through the state. And as long as we can pass laws to make it legal, then it's just because we're obeying the law. So if we can just get Congress to declare war, we can send our soldiers to a country to invade them and destroy them under a just war. And that will be godly because it's just. It's a just war. Can we advance God's cause by using these methods? One person felt it was no. No. Okay, two. We got two. No. Do you see how the whole world right now is being drawn into this battle between this or that to pursue making it right through some mandate to control what somebody else does, to punish them if they don't do it, to coerce them, to manipulate them? What about laws to compel and force people we disagree with to do the things the way we think they should be done. We're not talking about simply restraining the predators or those who their actions inflict harm on others. We're not talking about laws that restrain people from inflicting harm. We're talking about forcing people to live the way you want them to live by, by threat of punishment. So, for instance, Jim Crow laws restricted blacks and allowed discrimination based in law and the enforcement of government. These laws coerced and compelled blacks to behave in certain ways that whites in society found acceptable. These laws were wrong, and righteousness required they be repealed and removed. Yes or no? Yes. What about laws that prevent same-sex couples from having the same civil liberties and legal privileges in society as married heterosexual couples? In creating laws that give individual adults liberty or civil liberties and freedoms to have their civil unions or marriages under the law, is that the same as requiring people to have those relationships? not the same as requiring. It's removing obstacles from individual liberty. What about laws that require people? Now, now watch, watch the shift here. Watch the shift. If you're not watching, you'll miss. What about laws that require people to participate in weddings? Somebody else's that in good conscience they don't believe they can participate in, like baking cakes or doing flower arrangements or photography. Is there a difference between restraining people from obstructing someone's civil union or marriage versus requiring people to participate in it? Yes. Are those the same? No. Do you, do you see the difference? What about laws that obstruct the government and others from interfering with your religious practice? In other words, we have laws on re religious freedom. Is that the same thing as requiring people to attend church or get baptized or pay tithe or any other form of religious observance? They're not the same. Righteous laws restrain coercive pressures on individual liberties. Unrighteous laws put mandates on people to conform their behaviors in ways that they themselves may not want to participate in. 
Whenever governments cross the line to advance morality by forcing consciences of others, they abuse their power and advance Satan's kingdom. Amen. Because they will always violate liberty, they will always do injustice, they will always incite rebellion, and societies will always fracture and divide into different groups fighting for or against these moral mandates. Very much like what we see happening in the world right now. It's not accidental, folks. This is a Satan, Satan's end time strategy. This is how he advances his kingdom. It doesn't matter whether the actual issue is right in its own facts. If you use these methods, you're wrong. For instance, we would all in here believe that today is the biblical Sabbath. We would all believe that based on the Bible evidence, right? But it would be wrong to advance that through legislation and require that others observe it. Even if it's right in its merits, it's wrong to use the method. And so many people get caught up in this because they think this is a right issue. So it doesn't matter which side of the issue you're on. Even if you're on the side that is, it's, well, we're on the side of the Sabbath, so it's right. Well, you are on the Sabbath is right, that's true. But it doesn't matter if you're on that side. If you use these methods, you're still on Satan's team. And that's what's happening in the world. This is how he wins. He splits into two groups, and he gets you to pick a side. And then he gets you to use his methods of, of beastly systems of government to advance it to force others to comply. So we're talking about Jonah. He lived in a time when he experienced real atrocities done to his people and terrible violence and abuse, and then he received a message from God to go to these very same people and call them to repentance, to warn them that if they don't change, they'll be destroyed. Consider the implications of the message. If he gives the message and they repent, what does that mean for Jonah? They're still around. More than that. False prophet. That's what he feels like. Perhaps that could be a spin put on it. Traitor. Traitor, maybe. Maybe he's okay. All right. I, I think you're correct that he had some of those concerns. But that's not the ultimate concern for Jonah. Might have been his right there, temporal concern. I'm thinking more eternal. If he does this, doesn't that mean, and they repent genuinely, some of them will be saved, eternally saved? He could have them as neighbors for all eternity in heaven. He'll never get rid of them. But it wouldn't be in heaven if he had that attitude. But from Jonah's perspective, of course, he's righteous. <clears throat> Consider our situation. Someone has done real wrong to you or your people. Enslaved them in the past, perhaps. Gone to war against them. Imprisoned them. Lied, discriminated, stolen from you or your people. What would your response be if God called you to go to those very people with a message of repentance? Do you have more empathy for Jonah? A message of his love to call them back to him for salvation. What did Jesus say? Matthew chapter 5, starting in verse 43. You have heard it said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. That you may be sons of your Father in heaven. He causes the sun to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love only those who love you, what reward will you get? Or not even the tax collectors doing that. And if you... Greet only your brother. What are you doing more than others? Don't even the pagans do that. Be perfect. Therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. What do you understand this to mean in the context of where we are in earth's history today and what we're dealing with? Well, it helps if you understand that your enemy is also your brother. I mean... If you, if you change it to something personal, if your brother did something horrible to you or whatever, uh, you might also want to take revenge, but also you might want to forgive and pray that he would become a better person. 
you know, that he wouldn't keep inflicting pain on you and others. But if you take, if you take that globally, that's also true. I, I would suggest to you that, that even your analogy of if we recognize our enemies as our brother only works when we have love in our heart for our brother. Mm. When Joseph's brothers saw him coming, did they forget, oh, who is that guy? Or is that my brother? Did they recognize Joseph as their brother? Did that protect them from enslaving him and selling him away? So in that case, they knew he was the brother, but they had no love in their heart for him. So I, I get your analogy. The, the idea here is when we think about our brothers or family, generally, normally, we're supposed to have a sense of love and concern for them, right? But it doesn't necessarily mean it's always true. And so the real issue here is if we don't have love in our hearts for them. And, and I like your analogy because I think when we do think about the people that we love and remember, okay, this, but for the grace of God, this could be my, my son, daughter, brother, sister, okay? And if we have that love, it can help us be more compassionate. But without the love, do the same thing. And what does the Bible say at the end of time? Doesn't it say brothers turn against family members and parents turn against their own children? Do we see right now there's a certain, I'm not going to bring it up because I said we wouldn't talk about it today, but is there a certain thing happening in society where this is actually happening? Family members are turning against family members. Yes. yes. It's unbelievable. People, there's a grand delusion happening. Satan, the grand liar, is filling people's minds with, su with such fear that they're, they're willing to turn against their own family members over something as inconsequential as this thing. And it's inconsequential in reality. It's inconsequential. But back to the text. Spiritual perfection is spiritual maturity. Perfection is spiritual maturity. And if you're spiritually mature to the point that you are following God's ways. So it's not about task performance, is it? about your heart. It's not about your heart attitude towards others, loving them like God loves. And did you notice that the law, the law that Jesus pointed out, he gave, he gave examples of law here. What, what law did he give example of? In the text, he, he recited examples. The sun shines on the evil. And the rain falls. These are laws of nature. Yeah, natural law. And how do those laws work? Natural design. They're constants. They don't discriminate. It doesn't matter whether the heart's evil. The laws of God are constants. So the sun doesn't treat people differently, but I've given this analogy before, and you'd be surprised how many people trip over it. It's a good one to use. If you had a Norwegian and a Nigerian standing in the Miami heat or the Sahara desert together, does the sun treat them differently? And so many people go, yes, no, the sun treats them exactly the same. Their skin condition responds differently to the sun, but the sun doesn't do anything different. This is God's law. Our condition uh, determines how we respond. Yes? What if you understand, you know, when someone hurts you, and um, you want to have that compassion, but you don't have that feeling? How do you get it? So, so that, that's a wonderful question. First, you, you don't focus on them. You focus on God. You, my view is you always focus on Christ. Fix your eyes on Christ, the author and finish your faith. And then you take that to Christ and you say, regardless of how I feel, what actions would you have me carry out for them? And love is more an action than it is a feeling. And pro many people wait till they feel the good feeling before they take the good action. And, and then you say, uh, t uh, guide me in, with your wisdom of the actions I need to take and how I treat this person regardless of how I feel. And then to the degree we can put ourselves in that person's shoes, we can remember in our own lives, if it wasn't for the grace of God, we'd be no different. If it wasn't for God's love that's been shown to us by grace and mercy and other people in our lives, I look back on my life and I can't tell you the numbers of people I'm thankful for who helped me become the person that I am. I didn't become the person I am in an in a, in a, uh, isolation chamber somewhere. And so we all can look back and see moments where we were given grace. And that helps us remember that, but for the grace of God, that, that we're all sinners, it's all fall short of the, grace, the glory of God and so forth. Yes? Will the feeling ever come? It depends. T typically, yes, the feelings change when the actions change, but not necessarily. The feelings might be quite righteous or right to the circumstance. For instance, when Jesus is being crucified, beaten, spit upon, and so forth, he had love for those people 
but I bet you it didn't feel good that weekend. Mm. And as long as that treatment persisted, I don't think Jesus was ever going to say, you know what, I do love them. And this is so much fun. I hope we can do it again next weekend. No, this was not fun. It didn't feel good. It was awful. Love was not how it felt. Love was what he did in the face of how it felt. He, he subdued his feelings in favor of correct judgment guided by reason and conscience. And in fact, there are... He can lie to us. That's exactly right. In fact, there's many stories of, of people other than Jesus in history who took actions of love that felt awful. Self-sacrificial actions. They cried and they sacrificed self to protect somebody else they love or to not retaliate against somebody else they love. Yes? Okay, two things. One, your question. I've lived with abuse all of my childhood and it's a process. It's coming through that, coming through that and looking to Jesus and getting from him what I cannot, what I cannot give. And so that's the, the way I got through it. And coming to the point where I was able to look at my abuser, confront him, and say, I forgive you, and truly mean it with all my heart. Now, that's supernatural. That's not normal. And who was the one that was transformed by your choice to forgive? Me. That's I was right. transformed. So for, under, uh, keep, finish your point. Okay, and that, that was the point for that. I've lived it. I've been through it. And I know that it's possible that you can, in your heart, because God changes you, you can, in your heart, truly forgive somebody and feel sorry for them and pray for them. So that's that point. But your other point about the law, um, he, he says in um, Matthew, for I tell you that unless your righteousness exceeds that of the Pharisees, law mm -hmm. that you're not even going to enter the kingdom of god so you're talking about specifically two laws and the ones that they were living by and and, and how did they practice law did they practice law as design law and how we live in harmony with god yeah. god and his methods yeah. or did they practice laws as rules that require enforcement rules okay. and enforcement can you get heart change by more rules no well, not the godly heart change. Perhaps, in fact, we, we, we can. The more we compel people and coerce people, we can cause more rebellion in their heart. Okay? And this is how Satan advances his kingdom. Real injustice and then imperial human governments forcing other people, not persuading and letting people be persuaded in their own mind, but compelling people against their conscience only instills rebellion. You take liberty away, it violates the law of liberty. You violate God's law. You destroy love. And this is Satan's plan. So what determines who ends up in heaven? You. So, so, so I didn't say who determines, I said what determines. Yes, you're right. We individually decide whether we end up in heaven or not, but, but what determines that? Whether you have a character like Christ. Whether you have, say that again? Whether you have a character like Christ. Whether you've had the character like So there's a lot of metaphors of that, circumcision of the heart, uh, conversion, rebirth, law written on the heart. Uh, could we say whether they've accepted Jesus in, in not necessarily the evangelistic way, but in the character of the heart way? Who do you trust? Who do you trust? I think that's critical. Uh, Will people? Go ahead. The Bible says how that plays out. Is when the sheep and the goats are I'm about to get there. You're ahead of me. It's, it's in my notes. Okay. We're coming up on that. Okay. Um, will people who end up in heaven be friends with Jesus and become like him in heart attitude? Yes. The answer is yes, right? Love God and love others, right? Will every person in their own lives make that decision or not? They will, won't they? And so every person is going to decide for or against Jesus. But you might think, well, how's that going to be in Afghanistan where they're right now killing all the Christians? Who's going to tell everybody else about Jesus in Afghanistan or in China where they're coming down hard on Christians? It is by each person being faced with circumstances in which they must decide what law they apply to their lives and how they treat others. There are two antagonistic principles at war for every heart and mind. 
God's law of love, truth, liberty, Satan's law of sin and death, more commonly known as survival drives, fear and selfishness, manifest in the world with in, imposed laws and coercive enforcement. Everyone will make a clear choice to which methods they practice in the treatment of others. And, and, and it is the world's unfolding events that bring people to these critical decision points. As the world continues to globalize and governments increase their coercive pressure, as liberties are removed, as lies increase, as fear and selfishness magnifies, and as crisis after crisis occurs, governments will add to their laws and increase their demands and, pr for pre and pressure and control. As this happens, every person will be faced with the choice of whether they live out God's laws or live out the law of sin and death, fear and selfishness. As we enter the last moments before Christ's return, God permits these events to unfold so that every person has the opportunity to choose for or against Jesus, but not in the evangelistic way, not in an altar call or profession of faith. They will make a choice in how they treat others. Will we love others more than self, therefore present the truth and love, leave them free, sacrifice our resources to help free and benefit and protect others, or will we love self most by, by withholding truth uh, for fear of rejection, by, by retaliation, uh, for, um, uh, for, by withholding truth for fear of arrest, by, by participating with those who would, who would arrest or censure or silence other people for speaking the truth, by using those same governmental mandates to, to silence those who speak words that we don't like. Ted, one more, one more thing. Uh, one thing I had to do is make a choice. You know, I came to a point in my life, you know, when I hit a bottom, I had to make a choice to forgive. And instead of holding on to all of that garbage on the inside, I had to make that choice. And then once you make that choice, I don't have the power to carry through that. But I made the choice, you know, I give it to you, God, and then spend time with him. And then he did the work in me mm. to be able to do that. So Jesus said, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all his angels with him, he will sit on his throne in heavenly glory. All the nations will be gathered before him and he'll separate the people as one from another as a shepherd separates his sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. And the king will say to those on the right, come to me, all you who kept my seventh-day Sabbath and were baptized in water and ate a vegetarian diet. All you who were vaccinated or unvaccinated. No, this is not going to be the deal. He's going to say, Lord, uh, he said, come to me, you blessed my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you took me in. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. When, then the righteous will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you and thirsty and give you drink? When did we see a as a stranger and take you in naked and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly I say unto you, as you've done it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, you've done it unto me. Then he will look to those on his left, depart from me, you cursed, into everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me no drink. I was stranger and you did not take me in. I was naked and you did not clothe me, sick and in prison and you did not visit me. They will say, Lord, when did we see you hungry and thirsty and a stranger and naked and, and, and not visit you? As surely I say, as, in as much as you've done it unto one of the least of these, you did not do it. As long as you did not do it to the least of these, you did not do it unto me. Every single person is going to decide, they're going to choose which law is written in their heart, what character they form by how they treat others. As events unfold, we will be placed in situations with more threats, more anxieties, more fears, and we will be tempted to retaliate and to use force, to kill or be killed, to protect self, to turn somebody in, to report somebody to deny somebody services, even health care services. Do you know people are being denied health care services right now for their political views in America? If the reports in the news are true, and they're not always true, maybe it's not true, but evidently it was a letter sent by the health care agency, so it's evidently in writing. For the translated, those who are ready to meet Jesus when he comes, the Bible describes them. These are they who do not love their life so much as to shrink from death. These are not suicidal folks. 
These are not people who don't love life. These people love life. But they're not afraid of death such that they will compromise their loyalty to God and break away from his principles and how they live. They're not going to break God's designs and how they live simply to save their life. But they have no desire to die. This love is not a power we can conjure. It is not a force of will. This power is the power of love transforming the soul. It is the power of God to cast out all fear. It is the power of Jesus living in the heart. It is a result of the cleansing of the spirit temple by the indwelling of Christ. This is a supernatural work that occurs only by a living trust relationship with Jesus. It is a result of coming back into a true knowledge of God and worshiping the creator by beholding him and being transformed. Out of the book Ministry of Healing, page 409. Like our Savior, we are in this world to do service for God. We are here to become like God in character and by a life of service to reveal him to the world. How does the gospel go forward? The final message of mercy? By people revealing his character and how they treat others. In order to be co-workers with God, in order to become like him and reveal his character, we must know him aright. We must know him as he reveals himself. A knowledge of God is the foundation of all true education and all true service. It is the only real safeguard against temptation. It is this alone that can make us like God in character. This is the knowledge needed by all who are working for the uplifting of their fellow men transformation of character, purity of life, efficiency in service, adherence to correct principles, all depend upon a right knowledge of God. This knowledge is essential preparation both for this life and the life to come. And then the author goes on to describe that right knowledge of God is found in Jesus. If you've seen me, Jesus said you've seen the Father. Thus we are to fix our eyes on Christ, the author and the finisher of our faith. And Jesus tells us that we must love our enemies and pray for those. who We cannot buy into the system of the world to seek to do justice with more laws to punish the people who we don't think are living the way we think they should live. That is a trap. It's how the beast rises. Again, the beast of Revelation, this beastly system, is not rising to set up Satan worship cult centers where people sacrifice babies. That's not going to happen. He's going to rise to do justice in the world, to make things right through imperial law and forcing people to comply, probably to save lives in some way. We must stop advancing or attempting to advance God's government through human governments. What does this look like? Christian Day... Sergei was a French Catholic monk and Trappist prior of a monastery in Algeria. And with the rise of radical Islam in 1993, uh, he knew his life was in danger. But instead of leaving, uh, this priest chose to stay and continue witnessing the gospel of Jesus Christ. On May 24, 1996, Father Sergei was beheaded by Muslim radicals. Anticipating his death, he left a testament to be given to his family, and in part, this is what he wrote before he was beheaded. If it should happen that one day, and it could be today, that I become a victim of the terrorism which now seems, to, seems ready to encompass all the foreigners living in Algeria, I would like my community, my church, my family, to remember that my life was given to God and to this country. I asked them to accept that the one master of all life has not, was not a stranger to this brutal departure. I asked them to pray for me, for how could I be found worthy of such an offering? I asked them to be able to associate such a death with the many other deaths that were just as violent but forgotten through indifference and anonymity. My life has no more value than any other nor any less value. In any case, it, is not, it has not the innocence of childhood. 
I have lived long enough to know that I share in the evil which seems, alas, to prevail in the world, even in that which would strike me blindly. I should like, when the time comes, to have a clear space which would allow me to beg forgiveness of God and of all my fellow human beings, and at the same time to forgive with all my heart the one who would strike me down. Obviously, my death will justify the opinion of all those who dismissed me as naive or idealistic. Let him, let him tell us what he thinks now. But such people should know that my death will satisfy my most burning curiosity. At last I will be able, if God pleases, to see the children of Islam as he sees them, illuminated in the glory of Christ, sharing in the gift of God's passion and of the Spirit, whose secret joy will always be to bring forth our common humanity amidst our differences. I give thanks to, to God for, for this life, completely mine yet completely theirs too to God who wanted it for joy against and in spite of all odds in this thank you which says everything about my life I include you my friends past and present and those friends who will be here at the, at the side of my mother and father my sisters and brothers thank you a thousandfold and to you too my friend of the last moment who will not know what you are doing. Yes, for you too, I wish to thank you. This adieu, whose image is in you also, that we may meet in heaven like happy thieves. If it pleases God, our common Father. Amen. I want this kind of love, but I know it's not natural to my heart. I know that I need the grace of Christ and I need a supernatural work. I'm far too easily pulled by the feelings of resentment and anger into the trap of Satan. I want us all to see Jesus more clearly, to focus upon him, to know his love and be transformed so that when the trials come, and I think they're coming, when the threats come and the enemies attack, the love of God will overflow us and extinguish the fear. Amen. And we will be like Jesus and love our enemies. Amen. It is my view that as the end time events unfold, there will be two classes of people. Those who have God's law written in their hearts so that in action, in deed, in function, they love God and others versus those who have fear and selfishness established as the law of their life, and they live out those methods in how they treat others. We will be faced with a choice. Do we love our enemies, pray for those who spitefully use us, or do we harbor hate, resentment, bitterness, and seek to use power, including legal power of the state, to punish and force others to comply with what we think is right? Every person will decide. God help us because I know I cannot love my enemies in my own strength. Amen. I want to. My head recognizes the necessity, but it's not in me in my strength to do it. Yeah. It requires the Spirit of God to place that love in my heart. And it says in Romans 5.5, 5, if we trust Him, He pours His love into our hearts. Mm -hmm. It is through our daily practices preparing ourselves through worship and time with Jesus that we develop the trust, the faith, the relationship with God so that when faced with such circumstances, we're capable of receiving that power when we need it. But if we don't prepare in our daily lives, in our daily journeys, then we won't be capable of receiving the love even when it's poured out. we will ultimately all live out the law that we embrace and cherish. Mm. Consider this quote from a book called Conflict and Courage. And anybody have a comment before I read this quote? Comment, question. No. This is from Conflict and Courage, page 371. 
Each actor in history stands in his lot and place, for God's great work after his own plan will be carried out by men who have prepared themselves to fill positions for good or evil. In opposition to righteousness, men become instruments of unrighteousness, but they are not forced to take this course of action. They need not become instruments of unrighteousness any more than Cain needed to. Men of all character, righteous and unrighteous, will stand in their several positions in God's plan. With the characters they have formed, they will act their part in the fulfillment of history. In a crisis, just at the right moment, they will stand in the places they have prepared themselves to fill. Believers and unbelievers will fall into line as witness to confirm truth that they themselves do not comprehend. All will cooperate in accomplishing the purposes of God, just as did Annas, Caiaphas, Pilate, and Herod. In putting Christ to death, the priests thought they were carrying out their own purposes, but unconsciously and unintentionally they were fulfilling the purpose of God. God looks into the tiny seed that he himself has formed and sees wrapped within it the beautiful flower, the shrub, the lofty, wide-spreading tree. So does he see the possibilities in every human being. We are here for a purpose. God has given us his plan for our life, and he desires for us to reach the highest standard of development. He desires the youth to cultivate every power of their being and to bring every faculty into active exercise, law of exertion. Let them look to Christ as the pattern from which they are to be fashioned, law of worship. The holy ambition that he revealed in his life, they are to cherish, an ambition to make the world better for having lived in it, law of love. This is the work to which they are called. You want, to, you want now to so relate yourself to society and to life that you may answer the purpose of God in your creation. We are preparing now, day by day, focusing and spending time with Christ, unplugging from the world. Stop being propagandized by the world's methods of right and wrong. All the kingdoms of the world are Satan's. We cannot advance God's kingdom by practicing his methods. Yes? So put some words to this concept of being that loving person representing God when you get so many people pressuring you that you're not loving because you aren't doing the, you know... The The vaccine? Yes. You know, how, how do you respond in a way that shows that concept? So love never compels, and love never, never, never forces. Love can never be compelled or forced. So when they say that to you, you would say you're a lover of the truth. And if they have compelling truth, evidence that is persuasive, you absolutely want to do what's most healthy in harmony with God's will for your life. So persuade me with the evidence. And what happens when you do that, what happens is the people who hold the other position get more, more agitated and more angry because the, the evidence they have is not persuasive. It's not persuasive at all. In fact, the, the more evidence that comes out, the more it shows that their view is, is, a, is a corrupt and organized corruption. It's an organized corruption. And there's a, there's a grand scheme behind it. Uh, for instance, multiple, over 200 studies out in peer-reviewed journals show that if somebody gets the active infection and you treat them with early home treatment protocols, you reduce hospitalizations death by 86%. Over 200 published journal <coughs> articles show this. 86% reduction in hospitalization and death. But what's the official, still, as far as I know, if, if it's changed, it's changed very, very recently, but the official recommendation out of the government is if somebody gets diagnosed, you send them home with no treatment. A doctor in Chattanooga was fired yesterday, from what I understand, I got a text this morning, because he prescribed an early treatment from one of, from one of the uh, 15, there's a 15 studies on this particular treatment that showed early treatment actually reduced hospitalizations 86%. So he prescribed that treatment, and that treatment itself has, 
It's, it's one of the, um, one of the uh, treatments used, uh, approved, um, uh, what's the National Institute, no, the World Health Organization's essential medications. It's been around for, what, 30, 40 years or so. Not one death ever attributed in the world to this medication. It's extremely safe. So at the worst, you're not causing any harm. You're not injuring. You're just not helping. But this doctor was fired for prescribing this treatment, which is 15 studies show it actually reduces hospitalization and death. This is not normal medical practice. Uh, doctors through, through my entire career have, have consistently, I think, what, at least 45 or 50 percent of all treatment is what's considered off-label treatment. As long as there's evidence, it's rational, it's reasonable, it's not going to cause harm, it's likelihood or there's some basis for its success, doctors are given liberty. What's going on in our society today? It's going on because there's some other agenda here. So my point is, the 650,000 deaths we have in America, you could reduce that by 85, 86% if they actually did proper medicine, but there's an agenda not to reduce it. Why? Why is that an agenda? So the loving, so if you actually go, so show me the evidence. I'll show you mine, you show me yours, and let's see where the evidence leads us. And the evidence would lead uh, to a person being left free the, uh, the injections, they have a certain benefit. I think there's evidence of that. There's a certain benefit to them. There's also unknown risks. And anybody who says there's not unknown risks, they're just lying to you because there is no long-term safety. It's going to take time to know. Those risks may turn out to be nothing. And it may turn out that they're completely safe with no long-term risk. But we, we can't know that until the time has unfolded and we've seen that. And so, where is the traditional practice and ethics of medicine that we present the treatments, the risks? Uh, I get, since we, I wasn't going to talk about it, but you brought it up. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, let, uh, according to the CDC, people under the age of 20, in the, since, since, we've been, since COVID had broke in, in America, I think there's been 460 deaths of people under the age of 20 in America out of 70 million. And, and, and I'm, I'm, it was either 260 or 460. I'm taking the high number. So 460 out of 70 million. What's the, uh, what's the attitude? If you, just, just get a sense in your community of, of the attitude that parents have about the risk to their kids right now. They're terrified. They're terrified. Now, what's the, uh, every year in America, if you look at the CDC web, website, how many people die every year in America from chicken pox? 200. 200 people. <laughs> every year in America die from chicken pox. She was mm -hmm. So when we were kids, uh, when we were kids, and one of the kids got chicken pox, what did the parents do? Put all the kids at chicken pox parties, chicken pox pajama parties in the neighborhood. Were parents actually interested in killing their kids? No. Did they not love life? But 200 kids, or 200 people at least, die every year in America from chicken pox. 460 have died under age 20 in America from COVID. And that's 200 kids die now with a vaccine. With a, well, I'm not saying, I, I didn't say kids. I, 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 it's, I, didn't, I didn't look at the age range on the chicken pox, but 200 American people in America die every year. So I don't know what their age range is. So, but, but the point being is, people die of chicken pox. And in that age range, that relative risk from COVID is about the relative risk for the population dying of chickenpox. We're not, we don't live in fear of chickenpox. We're not terrorized by it. That age range, you shouldn't have terror over it. It doesn't mean there's no risk. It's not zero. But it's so small, the, the, the nation, the, the, the society should not be held captive by fear. Parents shouldn't be held in fear of this for their kids. It's ridiculous. But they are. Why? There's a, and this is not love. Love doesn't do this. Love doesn't misrepresent things. And there's constant, constant, constant misrepresentation. Another doctor in the community was told that if he doesn't take down his, he's got a not-for-profit ministry. And the not-for-profit ministry put up information from published peer-reviewed journals on his not-for-profit ministry site about early home treatments. And, and he was told by his employer, because uh, he's an employed physician, that if he doesn't shut down his not-for-profit ministry website, they're going to fire him. How can we support somebody like that? Pardon? How can we support somebody like 
Well, I, I'm not going to mention names in here. I'm just telling you the, uh, uh, the, 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 the process of what's happening here. You can, again, without getting into the weeds of all the details and the stats and the statistics and the treatments, the methods, the methods of God do not compel and do not coerce. They just don't do it. They don't lie. They don't misrepresent. They're lovers of truth. And in any branch of medicine throughout my entire career, it's an unfolding pr thing. A, a, a treatment comes out, a diagnosis, a new discovery, and, what, and, and we think it means this, and later we find out it means that, or this doesn't work as well as we thought it did, and it's got the, but, but the lovers of truth are constantly open to have their current understanding of this intervention or that treatment updated with new evidence and truth. That is not happening here. There's not honest, open, free exchange of information on this. That should ro raise a red flag, and it's coming from one side. It's one side that uses methods that are contrary to historic medical ethics and contrary to God's kingdom of love. So love functions in a certain way. It's always truthful. It's always open to, to be corrected. It's always open for more information and facts. It never coerces and never compels. So those who want you to love, you ask them, are you going to use the methods of love? Or are you going to side with those, those because you're afraid and you're going to use love as a tool to manipulate me to do something that I'm not persuaded and just, to, just out of, it's like the kid who says, well, mom, if you love me, you let me go to this party. <laughs> no, it's because I love you, I won't. And even at the end of the day, loving others is subordinate to loving God. And the Bible tells us that we are to present our bodies to God as a living sacrifice, which is an act of spiritual worship. And if your conscience, you're convicted that you must conduct your body in such a way to honor God, it comes before actually what other people would have you do for that. You remember a, a similar principle with Daniel and his three friends. When the, uh, when the guy tried to talk them into it, he wasn't trying to talk them into it to hurt it. He didn't want them to actually get in trouble with the king. He was actually, if you, you know what, just go along. You won't get, in, we don't want you to get chastised. Just eat the food. Go along. Why cause stress? Why bring attention to yourself? But Daniel wanted to honor God with his body. Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for your love. Give us discernment and wisdom in each of our circumstances, and there's so many, and so many are under pressure, Lord. We've had emails this week requesting um, pr special prayer for people who are finding themselves in job circumstances where they're being pressured to take actions that they're not convinced is in their best interest nor in the way that, that they can honor you with their lives. We ask that you will provide them the wisdom they need, the discernment they need, the actions that need to take in their circumstances. They will conduct themselves with grace and with love towards, towards those who are uh, seeking to pressure rather than seeking to win. We ask also you open opportunities, opportunities of escape. And if it's your will that some of these individuals find themselves before tribunals or various committees or, or courts, give them the words to speak and the courage to stand on principle to advance your kingdom at this time because every person on the earth is being faced with circumstances and situations about what law they will apply to their lives. And we want your kingdom to be advanced. And we ask for your mercy, for your blessings, and for your empowerment in our own lives that we can, we can love as you love, Lord. We pray in your holy name. Amen. Amen. And uh, we are going to have a...